Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Ellie Stein, and this is my video tip of the month for March 2024. Unlike most of my previous video tips, this one isn't about how to progress your health. It's about hardcore research, understanding the pathology behind long COVID. I'm going to describe a paper recently published in a very prestigious journal called Nature Communications by Professor Robert Woost and his colleagues, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, from the Long COVID Clinics of the Amsterdam University Medical Centers and the Free University of Amsterdam, both in the Netherlands. Now, the goal of their study was to try to understand the abnormalities that underlie fatigue and decreased exercise capacity in people with long COVID and to see whether it's the same or different than the pathology underlying post-exertional malaise in those same patients. To look at this, they studied 25 people with long COVID and 21 people who had had COVID but had fully recovered. They did tests of blood and muscle before and after a full-on exercise test. They reasoned that the abnormalities they found before they put the subjects uh, to the exercise test would be reflective of ongoing fatigue and decreased capacity, whereas the abnormalities they found after the test might be more reflective of post-exertional malaise. Now, during the exercise test, the participants with long COVID did worse. They had lower VO2 max, that's the gold standard measure of exercise capacity, and they also had decreased peak power. Another really interesting finding is that they had decreased exercise, uh, oxygen extraction from the blood. So we pump oxygen uh, into our blood and the lungs. The heart moves that blood around the body. The blood goes to organs and muscles, and those organs and muscles use the oxygen so that when the blood comes back to the heart through the veins, it has much less oxygen. This oxygen extraction number was lower than expected in the people with long COVID. Dr. David Sistrom at Harvard University has found the exact same thing, both in people with ME and long COVID. Now, before exercise, the muscle biopsy showed that the people with long COVID had a higher proportion of what's called glycolytic fibers. These are muscle fibers that rely on short bursts of energy that create uh, ATP or cellular energy in very inefficient ways. And they had less of the better fibers, the fibers that allow for oxidative phosphorylation. Just to give you some numbers, in oxidative phosphorylation, we can make 32 molecules of ATP or cellular energy from one molecule of glucose. Whereas with glycolysis, we can only make two molecules, right? So this is a huge decrease in the amount of energy produced. And sure enough, when they measured some of the molecules in the muscle, they found that there was evidence that oxidative phosphorylation was underactive and glycolysis was overactive. This means that the mitochondria have shifted their metabolism from the more efficient to the less efficient way. In addition, they found an increase in amyloid-containing deposits. Now, amyloid is a misfolded protein that basically gunks up cells and stops them from working efficiently. What was interesting, though, is that these amyloid deposits were not found in the little capillaries, and they reasoned, therefore, that the decrease in oxygen extraction was due to mitochondrial changes and not due to the little capillaries being blocked and not letting the oxygen into the muscles. 
In addition, more people in the long COVID group had atrophy or even death of muscle fibers even before they were put on the exercise test. Finally, they looked for the evidence of the SARS-CoV virus in the muscles, and believe it or not, they found it in every single subject, not the, the virus, but the nucleocapsid protein, so evidence that the virus had been there. And they therefore reasoned that the presence of this protein didn't distinguish between the people with long COVID and the people that had recovered. So it probably isn't part of the problem. Now, when they exercised, the people with long COVID, 100% of them reported post-exertional malaise. In particular, they had increased muscle pain, fatigue, and cognitive symptoms, and these symptoms lasted at least seven days. So what did they find after they exercised the people with long COVID? Acute exercise resulted in a reduction of skeletal muscle mitochondrial enzyme activity. So basically the mitochondria didn't have all of the enzymes or constituents they needed to create energy. Amino acid levels also dropped and with exercise, so this is uh, consistent with post-exertional malaise. And key metabolites of the citric acid cycle, this is one of the energy producing cycles in the body, were decreased in the people with long COVID. And again, even more increased markers of glycolysis or this inefficient way of producing energy. These gunky misfolded amyloid proteins were even more abundant in the people with long COVID after exercise. And the people with long COVID had even more severe muscle damage after exercise than before. So what can we conclude from all of this? Even before exercise, the people with long COVID had abnormalities. They had a shift from an efficient way of producing energy through oxidative metabolism to an inefficient way through gly glycolysis. And the muscle fibers had made a shift as well from fibers that run on oxidative metabolism to fibers that run on glycolysis. Really important to note that there was no evidence that any abnormalities of breathing or heart function contributed to these abnormalities. And also very important because of some ancient research now, the findings showed uh, differences from what would be expected if the decreased exercise capacity was the result of sedentary behavior or deconditioning. So basically the researchers ruled out deconditioning as the cause of the problems. So what about post-exertional malaise? They concluded that post-exertional malaise is associated with both local and body-wide metabolic disturbances. Metabolic basically means the mitochondria weren't working to produce energy efficiently. Also, PEM was associated with damage to the muscle cells themselves and buildup of these amyloid-containing deposits that make cells not work as well. There was also the presence of some immune cells called macrophages and CD3 positive T cells in the muscle, suggesting that there's a bit of inflammation going on as well. Now, a couple things make this research really exciting. One is, as I mentioned, it's published in a very prominent journal, Nature Communications. This means a lot of people are going to read the article and they're going to take it seriously. Secondly, this uh, research was funded, at least in the in the early stages, by an, an American nonprofit called Solve ME, and this shows the power of people, ordinary people, who donate to some of these nonprofits like the Open Medicine Foundation and Solve ME that can really make a difference. So consider supporting some of the nonprofits for the diseases that are relevant to you and help move research forward.